Okay, so we're already on week four. It's just amazing how fast the time has gone. It really has. Um, and it's you guys are doing great. I mean, there are nine students in this class, from what I, and from what I could see when I grade, I couldn't have asked for better performance by almost all of you, but by all of you. It's uh, the work is well done. The assignments are clear. You're following the directions. It seems like you're understanding what you need to know. I could not be more pleased. So um, class is going real well. This is a great class. Um, we're now on bond valuation. So that's an important tool that you need to know. Uh, the activities this week mostly center around bond valuation. So um, what are bonds? I've traded bonds for many years uh, as a professional. Basically, they're homogenized loans. Think of them like IOUs. Companies float bonds. Individuals borrow money and they become bonds. Like you buy, you, you take out a mortgage or you take out a car loan. The geniuses in the financial industry will take those loans, package them as collateral, because that's what collateral is, things that back your debt, and then make it into a bond. And what the bond does is it's a homogenized version of a loan. So, for instance, uh, when you go to buy gasoline, you buy it by the gallon. You don't go in and say, give me this much, or even milk, you buy it by the quart, by the half gallon or the gallon. And the reason why we do it that way in almost everything, a box of cookies, right? A, uh, you know, you go, even when you buy T-shirts, you know, underwear, T-shirts, you know, men's T-shirts that they put under their, you know, the regular shirt. You packages of three, right? Everything gets homogenized. And what that does is it creates liquidity, which is really important. Without liquidity, the markets cease. Think of it like not oiling your engine. It's just going to go cease. You know, you don't have liquidity. You don't have that, 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 that fungible movement. And what that means is, what I mean by that is, by all, all of us understanding, this is what a gallon of gas is, and this is what it costs, and here's where you buy it. Or this is what a, this is how I buy milk, and these are the different versions of milk, and I buy by the quart, half gallon, a gallon, and I can get familiar with the pricing. I don't have to think about it when I go to the store. You just do it. Okay, yeah, I need a half a gallon. Let me get it. Okay, I need a loaf of bread. And it's the same thing with the bond market. We've taken this debt and we create these instruments. They're basically $1,000 pieces. Even if you bought a billion dollars worth of bonds, in other words, you loan money. When you buy bonds, you're loaning money to somebody. Even if I buy a, thousand, a million, billion dollars worth of bonds, so let's say I'm a big fund like Fidelity or um, a bank, I buy them in $1,000 pieces. I buy $1, one billion worth of $1,000 bonds. And essentially what the bond is, is you're handing over $1,000 for each bond, no matter what, the, no matter how much of it you buy. You're effect effectively giving money to, to a corporation, the government, or, or, or mostly corporations or government float bonds. And then they're going to pay you a stated rate of interest, let's say 5%. And then at the end of however long the bond goes for, let's say five years, let's say you had a five-year bond. Let's say a company needs money for five years and they want to pay 4% interest. Well, you would buy those bonds in $1,000 pieces and you would receive 5% on your money, which is $50 a year. And at the end of five years, they give you $5,000 back, assuming they stay in business. That's always the risk. The more risky the company, the higher the rate, just like your credit rating. The more risky you are, the higher the rate you pay because you're more risk. So the lender wants to be compensated for that risk in case you do not pay. And the less risky the um, issue, the lower the rate. And ge generally speaking, bonds pay every twice a year. So if you had a five-year bond at five at four percent, you would get for a thousand dollars, you would get two twenty-five dollar checks, and in the end, you would get a one thousand dollar payment. And when you think about it, and then there's a indenture, which is the contract that governs the bond. And most indentures, they're like this thick, you know, they're pages. But I would say 95, 96, 97% of that is what you would call boilerplate. Like when you take a lease on a car, you fill out all that paperwork. But if you took 10 leases 
from different companies, 97% of them, it's the same language, just protects all the different liabilities. And the other 3% is how much is the car cost? What is the buyout? Things that are just specific to the car. And it's the same thing with the bond. Most bonds, if I took 100 indentures, which are contracts with that underlie the bond, and you would look at them all, you would find that if you read them 97 to 98% of most prospectuses and dentures are the same language. It's called like mortgage contracts. It's the same language. It's oil, we call it boilerplate is the lingo. But then the last two or 3% are more indigenous to the loan. And, um, and by doing that, we have a homogenized instrument and then it trades in the market because now, how do you value a bond? Well, it's the time value of money. And that's what you've been learning, right? It's a bunch of cash flows and a final cash flow. And then you get a rate of interest and you can discount the back and find the value today. So what I want to show you, and I'm going to share my screen now. And by the way, you know, this has been great. Guys are doing great. I have not had a student in the classroom, which is fine. I mean, that's how we design this. Just give me the code word, which you guys have done. But uh, I want to say to you like once again, it's coming toward the end that I could not be happier with the way the class is going and contact me if you need anything, you know, just about anything. I mean, I know that the nature of Rasmussen and, and why it works so well is they do such a good job and we do it in a way where we want you to be able to work at your own pace, but still have the in-class feeling. And that's the purpose of the discussions, quite frankly. But I want you to know that uh, I'm always here for you. Please contact me if you need anything. If you have my text, you can text me, messaging system. I mean, I've got a few messages from you guys. And um, just always be cognizant of when the class ends. That's the main thing. You know, I know some of you, most of you are right on time, so it's great. If you needed a day, sometimes somebody says, well, I need an extra day, professor. You know, child is caught a cold and, you know, hey, life goes on. You know, the, uh, we have lives outside of here. So, you know, very rarely am I ever going to, question because you know, I understand where people are coming from and I'm not here to make somebody's life more in, in difficult I'm here to make you like education learn and, and and say you know what that was a good experience and I'm 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 I'm, I'm moving forward but um but by the so so like I say somebody somebody texts me and say professor or they email me I just need an extra 24 hours because you know the car is in service this happened okay don't worry but what I need is that last week, please stay on top of that. Because the way schools work and the way universities work, they want those grades and rightly so. Because me, people need to move forward with the next semester. So that's the only thing I'm gonna say um, to be aware of. Okay, so let me share my screen. And all right, so it's our class room. And here's our class. So in week four, I put a few things on here. Now, I've been telling you and I've been, you know, talking about my um, YouTube videos for, you know, from the, from the beginning and I've included it. Here, I just put it right in um, the shell because this is a great video on the nature of bond valuation. So I would strongly suggest that you watch this video. Um, I, you know, this is one of my earlier videos. Believe it or not, it has like 298 views and people really like it. Mr. Trax, whoever he is, did a great video. Natalie Bio, I remember this young lady. She said, thanks a lot for sharing. So um, really nice people. And please watch it because I took an, a textbook. And this again, this is one of my old school videos. So you could see, I mean, now I do everything more sophisticated, but it's such a good video. I'm not going to change it. And. Okay, so this is a video that I did. Please watch it. 
please watch it because you're going to find it very useful in terms of understanding the bond valuation process. Once again, if you go to my playlist and you go to Finance Academy, I'm going to stop that there. Um, you can find this and other videos. Actually, videos on the Federal Reserve are really uh, interesting, especially through the markets, the way we're, we're um, experiencing them now. So the Fed has a lot to do with how the markets move and how the bond markets move because they are modulating interest rates. So I would suggest if you really want to dig deeper and it's good for your own edification because interest rates are such an important part of your life, you may want to watch these. And uh, we've already been through capital asset pricing model. Um, let's see if there's anything else. Uh, creating a mortgage calculator, I guess, sort of like bonds. And uh, yeah, that bond one is probably the best one you could you could you could look at at this point. So I hope. And oh, here we go. A bond price calculator example. So you may want to look at that. Okay, you may want to take a, look, a little bit of a longer video, but you may want to take a look at that one. All right, so that's you can get directly to that video and the playlist through here. There's our overview and activities. And our keyword this week, you ready? Dun, da, da, da. Federal Reserve. Our keyword is, well, they're words, I guess, Federal Reserve. So you have to read this Federal Reserve keyword. Watch the Excel. You know, you want to model this, you want to learn how to model it. And there's the assignment. Now, as usual, I gave you a help. I gave you help. And the reason why I do that is not for you to directly copy it, but it's a guide. So as you're working through it, you're saying, okay, that's right. Okay, I, I'm getting it. Okay, I could double check my work. But obviously, you have to put together your own spreadsheet. And that, to me, is a good way to learn. You know, because sometimes when you're flying blind, especially in an online class, then you give it to me, then I got to give you feedback, and then you're still not sure how that worked. That could get very frustrating. And I like to say, here's how the engine works. Now you make a copy of the engine. And if you do that with understanding how the thing, how the bonds work, or in this case, options last week, you're going to get it right and you're going to have a template for valuing things. So that's my methodology here, and it's worked very well. Live classroom, we're doing that now. And these are the ebook chapters, right? These are the ebook chapters. So this is the bond pricing variables. So this is a set formula for pricing a bond. Obviously, you could do all of this in Excel, but the price of a bond equals its coupons divided by a discount rate. This is the coupon. The coupon being that month, that that yearly, that annual payment. This is an annual payment. If it was a semi-annual payment, you would have to adjust this. It's the coupon. This this accounts for the coupon. Over a discount rate. And then the last thing is the money you get back. And that would give you the value of your bond. And as the rate goes up, the discount is higher and the price is lower. And as the rate goes down, the discount is less and the price goes up. That's why it's very important to understand this. <laughs> when rates go up, bond prices go down. You're seeing that in the markets right now with the Fed not being as accommodative and rates going up and the stock market going down and bond prices go down. And when the rates go down, prices go up. So this is... This is an important thing to understand. And it's all a function of just discounting, right? It's all a function of just discounting. I'll show you an example in a minute. So that's the bond pricing variables, bond pricing techniques. Um, you can bootstrap. That's something you have to get too deep into here. But what bootstrapping is, is if I have like, the, the, the five-year rate, if I have the zero-year, the one-year rate, the two-year rate, the three-year rate, rate, I could mathematically project what the other rates will be, like the four, the five, the ten, because it's a um, rates are sometimes a function of each other. At least the then, the then you could see where the market trades versus the rate that you come up with. But I can actually create a yield curve. What's a yield curve? 
a yield curve is a, like a graph of rates. So for instance, um, let me get the Wall Street Journal up for you, which I subscribe to, which I strongly recommend you get a student subscription and going forward because there's just so much information you could use. So for instance, we're gonna look at the bond market today. Okay, here we go. Bear with me, the same thing is coming up. Hmm. It's weird. Okay, here we go. So I'm gonna go to bonds. If you call up the Wall Street Journal and go to markets, you're gonna see the different rates. So you got the one year rate, the two year rate. Notice they kind of go up because rates, that's the yield curve. On the X axis has time and the Y axis has percentage. And it, it is a normal yield curve. It's an upward sloping curve because we would expect money to get more expensive if we want to borrow it for a longer term. There's three kind of, you got to think about liquidity. You got to think about term and take out a loan. You also got to think about inflation. So because because of the time value of money, we should expect rates to go up. We should also expect it to go up because lenders are going to demand higher rates for longer periods of time. If you want to borrow money from me for a year, it's going to be less risky than if you want to borrow money from me for 20 or 30 years. So we can bootstrap, actually. If I know the five-year and I know the one-year, mathematically, bootstrapping would allow me to come up with some theoretical value for the years in the middle. And then there's the actual way the market trades. So this is really good stuff. I'm going to leave that up for a minute. But don't forget how I got there. I went to the Wall Street Journal markets and I went down to bonds and rates. And what's nice about bonds and rates, and that's why I tell you to subscribe and stay on top of it, you actually have mortgage rates. So you, so you don't just go blindly into taking out a mortgage. And now you know what a mortgage rate should look like. And look over the last year, mortgage rates have actually jumped, have actually jumped 1%, which is a big movement. And then you have jumbo mortgages, and then you have car loans. So you get an idea what the actual rates are. So the journal is really good. Actually, even got overseas loans. And then the economic calendar, which affects the markets. So hopefully you'll take advantage of that. That's basically what bootstrapping is. Um, going back here, you have some equity valuation models. They just get into some more models again go to my go to my uh, youtube and watch that because i give you all the equity valuation models on my youtube uh, where do i do that very popular one of my most popular videos i literally take you through every equity evaluation model you're going to be using outside the capital asset pricing model which is its own set of videos so i've got like almost 800 views on that i mean i know it's not a one of these crazy viral YouTubes, but it's really helpful for people who want to learn. Okay. There's a very popular um, video that I do. So those are rates, right? And we talked about the bond market. And why do we call it coupons? Why do we call it coupons? Well, um, let's look at a corporate bond. And the government also rate sells bonds, right? Well, let's look at a corporate bond. So a corporate bond, let's pull up an image. Back in the day when you loaned someone money, they would actually give you this bond. And if you notice, let's take a look, the bond has these little coupons underneath. And so back, back, back in the day, this is great, it's very good. You would go to back to the bank, Rip off one of these coupons when the date came up and they'd give you your money. They give you fifty dollars, whatever you were supposed to get. So this is this is the this is why we call it coupons, because there was actual coupons. And then you'd hand in this to get your final money. Today, everything is done book entry. Everything is done with computers. So you don't do that anymore. But um interesting story. Uh let's see if I can find another one for you. That's a little better. There's a certificate. You actually got the certificates. Interesting story. Back in the day, before the, the computer age, um, when Wall Street, when traders, when companies traded bonds with one another, because you could trade in the bond market, right? You can. That's what makes these bonds so 
the bond market so interesting is because you could sell your bond at any point in time. If you were if you bought a bond where you're earning five percent, right, on that bond, and for and then with a similar company, same company, now they're now the rates because of the bond market, because of the Fed, those you know the money became uh, more accommodative. It was cheaper to borrow money, like a like a mortgage. Now everyone's only paying three. Well, if you had a mortgage, you would refinance. But if you had a bond, your bond would be worth more mathematically because you were getting five and everyone else is getting three. So the principal part would trade higher. And the coupons never adjust. It's the principal part, the one thousand dollar part. And so now it'd be probably worth eleven to twelve hundred dollars, and you could sell it into the bond market, or you can hold on to it at the end and just keep collecting the extra interest. So. Well, I'm gonna give you an example in a minute. So that's what a bond actually looked like. And funny story, and I, you know, and I used to, I thought it was really funny when I was a young man. Um, this is this is old. I don't know why this is here. When I was an old, when I was a young man, just starting out on Wall Street. You know, I come from New York, obviously. Uh, hold on a minute. It's frustrating. Okay, yeah, I'm sharing my screen. When I was a young man, just starting out on Wall Street. Um, Stop sharing. I'm just a little paranoid here. Okay, yeah, I want to make sure we're still we're still recording. Uh, when I was just starting out, they used to tell a story about how you know you'd have when 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 the comp when the brokerage houses traded with one another or clients traded through the brokerage houses, there were runners who actually had to bring the bonds over, and that's why if you go to go to downtown Manhattan, it's a, it's really a small place. I mean, the Manhattan is a big place. But for those of you who have traveled or taken a trip to Manhattan, the, the downtown part of Manhattan is like Boston or these these old cities where it's like it comes to a tip. And, you know, um, i show you some. So it looks like um, lower Manhattan, which I spent many time in, many, many years in. You know, I did business there. I didn't live far from there. Uh, so lower manhattan let's see if we can find a map of it it is an interesting place it's just like the tip of manhattan you know manhattan's a huge there's a map of manhattan it, you know goes it goes all the way up and and lower manhattan is down here so it's just the tip of manhattan and all the brokerage firms back then and the stock exchange stock exchange was located in lower manhattan so that was the reason why there was a this financial district and the reason why it, it worked that way was because you wanted these brokerage firms you didn't have them to the computer you know you wanted to be able to trade and transfer securities quickly so everything got them really quick there you go i mean that's where the world trade center was and if you take a trip it's a very um somber site obviously they built memorials there and the south street seaport uh i i live in new jersey so i live sort of down here like if you go down by where the time is down here and i take a ferry when i want to go to manhattan there's a ferry that comes maybe it's 10 minutes from my house and in 40 minutes i'm at the tip of manhattan and then the stock exchange leaves you off right here at the south street seaport i mean this isn't a travel log but it's it's interesting and it's a beautiful place i, I mean i'm you know it's, it's important you know it's a place where i grew up and there's wall street that leaves you off right here and then the stock exchange is right here. And so these companies, I mean, I worked at the World Trade Center years ago, and a lot of firms were located here, and people would just deliver the securities to one another. And then there's these crazy stories about how, like, a, a runner would have a couple of drinks and stop at a bar and leave the security sitting there. And usually the owner of the bar knew how to call, and he got a little bit of a reward for it. But sometimes they would forget, you know, millions of dollars worth of securities. Well, obviously that doesn't happen anymore, because now we live in a day and age where um everything is done by computer and and believe it or not and i guess it's kind of sad but it's good in a way lower manhattan has become more of a residential district because of the computer because people don't go down there anymore but back in the day it was very vibrant and um nowadays um yeah people more people leave manhattan leave lower manhattan every day because they live there to go to work in other places than for, for, for centuries, uh, well, for I guess for centuries, for at least 100, 150 years, there was an area where everybody just came into every day. No one lived here. When I was like in the 1980s, when I started working down here, everybody came into Manhattan. There's nothing in Lower Manhattan. It was all buildings. It was, it was beautiful. 
but today people live here. Like right here, they've they've turned it into whole residential areas. And it's absolutely come to you come to New York. It's it's an area to see. It's an area to see. And um, and you know, I'm actually going for my my uh, doc, I'm almost finishing up my doctorate. And I take it I, when I do go into the city, Pace University, which is where I'm getting it. Um, where I'm getting my doctorate, I have to go into the. Uh, I have to go into the city. I go right into Lower Manhattan. So yeah, this is. Um, I just want to show you something. Hey, why not? You gotta love Google. It's amazing, amazing stuff. It's not working. Actually, they have that. So the boat will leave you off right. The boat will leave you off right here. Right, the, here's where the boat docks. You see, this Dave took this on a day when with tons of people. I will cross, literally cross the street here. And then you walk up, you walk up Wall Street. So I don't know if I can get in there. Let's see if I can do this. Francis Tavern, famous place. There you go. So then you just, you know, then you just walk up Wall Street, and eventually, there it is, the New York Stock Exchange. Right? It's uh, wait, hold on, it's right up here. There's a bunch of places selling coffee. This guy's been here forever. You know, it's not the same as it used to be because of the, um, because again, most of the stuff is being done by computer. They're really nice restaurants and stuff like that. Um, stay with me for a minute. You know, I guess it's tough for them to, to okay, and that's that's the back of the stock exchange. So kind of, and then, hold on. Then, you know, you could be looking at it from every angle. It's, there's, a, there's a bunch of beautiful churches down there, places to eat. Um, I guess it's tough for Google. Yeah, here we go. And this is one of the oldest graveyards. This is right off of Wall Street. And this is the um, Trinity Church, which is, where some of the original settlers of Manhattan are buried and their families came up here and it's right in the middle of. So it's, a, it's not like if you've ever been to Boston or any of these older cities, Boston is one that I think is a lot like this. You you know, it's got that vibe, it's got that feel. And then of course you got Soho and you got uh, Chinatown and Little Italy. So it's really a great place to, to kind of visit, you know, and it's all within walking distance. There's Little Italy and Chinatown, which is really a lot of fun. So again, you know, I sorry for taking up the time, but I, ca I can't stress it enough. We go all the time. You know, we live not far. That's where I come from. Originally, come from here. This is where I grew up, not Red Hook. Um, I come from originally right here down in Bay Ridge. If you watch Blue Bloods, right where you see Blue Bloods. If you ever watch Blue Bloods, that's my area. That's where I went, grew up, went to school. Just where you see the Blue Bloods. If you ever watch that show, Blue Bloods, that's where I come from. Is we've got a big park here, Dyker Beach Park. My family, actually, when they came here in the 1800s, believe it or not, it's a true story, they owned part of this park. It was a farmland. It was farmland, and they sold it to the city. And so my family are in golf now because it became a golf course. So, yeah, this is where I grew up. Beautiful area. Still is. And then, you know, right across the Barrazano was Staten Island. I went to school there, met my lovely wife. Another really nice area. Now I don't live too far, though, right in New Jersey, off the Jersey Shore. So give you a little idea, a little perspective. So it wasn't hard to, for me. I was very fortunate because the area I decided to work in was not too far from where I um Not too far from where. I uh, I grew up. I just had to get on a bus, or I didn't really take the train as much. I drove in, or I took the bus because it was like twenty minutes, twenty five minutes. I mean, traffic was always a, a nightmare, but um, you know, 
but it worked out. Then you got the Jersey Shore, which is where I live. Nice area. So you got the Jersey Shore, and in the summers, it's a nice place. It's about ten minutes from my house, and the beaches are here. And so it's it's been an, it's I love it here. It's been a great area. In the winter, obviously, you're not doing a lot on the shore, but it's a great area. So if you come down, um, come over, say hello. But it gives you a little perspective. All right, that was fun for me. I hope it was fun for you. All right, so let's just do something really quick on bonds. Um, let's do something really quick on bonds. As a last thing, so you're going to have that spreadsheet that I gave you. So use that as a guide. But let's say let's look at our five-year bond. So our five-year bond pays. Let's make it annual. Let's make it easy. So we'll say it's a five-year annual bond. So our five-year bond is going to pay a coupon of fifty dollars a year. So we're going to do this right on Excel. Even though now we've looked at the at the formula that I showed you, let's see the formula in action. So we're going to have a coupon. I love hyphens. I love Excel. And the coupon is $50 a year. And that's going to be a five year coupon. And then we have a principal amount. Principal amount, which is your final payment, the money you lent, which is $1,000. And then you're going to have a rate. And so the bond was actually issued at 5%. So we're going to put 5%. Always put the percents on. Always put the percents on. Oh, you got to put 0 0.05. So first, let's discount and then time. And the time is going to be five years. So there's your terms. There's the terms you need to know. So what's the coupon worth? Well, if the, if nothing happens, then we should expect the coupon to be worth fifty dollars at the very start, right? So let's do it. Let's let's actually do it. So we go to formulas, and we're going to see what is that worth today. We're going to go to present value. So you can go to finance. And once you put it in, it'll show up in recently used. So the finance is going to tell me what's my rate? Five percent. What's my number of periods? Five. What's my payment? Fifty. Right. So what is it worth today? Five years, five percent. Right. Is going to be worth two hundred sixteen dollars. That's what the bond is going to be worth to me today, because I'm going to be getting these payments over five years, and I'm discounting it at five percent. So what's the principal amount worth then? So let's do that. We're going to recently use with the present value, and the rate is five percent. The number of periods is five, and the final value is a thousand. There's no payment. It's the final value. And that's going to be worth seven hundred eighty-three dollars. So let's sum it up. So the sum of these two pieces is thousand dollars, and that's what it should be worth. Because it's it's I just bought the bond, and the bond market is trading with, with exactly what I'm what I'm what I'm paying. What you know, it's exactly where it uh what I paid for the bond. There's no movement. But let's say all of a sudden the Fed lowers rates, and the same bonds with the same credit rating now trade at four percent. So the first piece of good news for me is I've got a bond that's worth more money. Because I'm getting five and everyone else is getting four. But what is it actually worth if I'm going to sell it in the bond market on day one? Now it's worth 1044 And notice that it's the principal that really adjusted. I could actually get more money now for my bond because the buyers will pay me more and they'll only get the they'll get the fifty dollars and the thousand dollars at the end, but the difference is the forty-four dollars that they lose. Is going to make up for the one percent difference in in the five percent that they got. What happens if rates go up? What should we expect? I'm going to give you a minute. And I want you to think about that. What should be the price of the bond if rates go up? Well, if rates go up, let's say to 6%, the bond values go down. So now you see it in action. Rates go up, bond prices go down. Rates go down, bond prices go up. And that the market reacts to that because people are losing money effectively. They're lending money at lower rates. Also puts pressure on equities because higher rates mean 
higher discounts on cash flows. And higher discounts on cash flows, if you remember, are piece on capital asset pricing model, that kind of hurts that value. Rates go to 10%, 810. So you get an idea of the nature of bond valuation nature of bond valuation and watch my video um and then here's another thing i want you to be aware of every day as time marches on this five-year bond now becomes a four-year bond so say two years down the road you're still holding on to this bond and now it's a three-year bond and every day it changes and so notice these numbers are going to change so and they'll become less sensitive because now you have less time so if i go back to my five percent number I'm still worth a thousand, but now I'm only discounting on a three year time frame. So notice if I go to 10%, which is not a good thing, right? We don't want to lose money, but it happens. I mean, hold on. It happens. At three years, the bonds were at 875, but when it was five years, the bonds were at 810 because I had more time to discount. So just by creating this little spreadsheet, you can you can play with it and get an idea of why rates move the way they do. And the Federal Reserve, obviously, as I said, was my Federal Reserve is the code word. And then going back to bonds, you know, and again, I can't stress this enough. Use you know, watch the Wall Street. Um, watch the you know, make use of the Wall Street Journal. Make use of the Wall Street Journal. And obviously the markets again rocked today at the 480 points but they did bounce back yesterday and the reason is you know the fed is not accommodating and there's an old wall street saying and a lot of these sayings really are applicable don't fight the fed and in this case they were right so that's it for this week i'm going to stop sharing um once again any questions you know where i am you have plenty of videos you'll have this video and always a pleasure always a pleasure and i uh, hope you to get a lot out of this and contact me if you need anything thank you